Carpe diem. Enjoy the day. You only live once. Seize the day. Carpe diem is the oldest philosophical motto in Western history. It's a motto many people live by and a lot of people get a tattoo of it. But is it really possible to seize the day in a world of consumerism, fully booked calendars and most importantly, the destruction of the internet. Today I'm talking with the writer and philosopher Roman Krasnarik who wrote a new book, sort of a biography about Carpe Diem to talk about this matter. So yeah, nice to meet you. Equally. For my viewers, can you try to explain in a nutshell what Carpe Diem is, what the meaning is? Yeah, so Carpe Diem is one of the oldest philosophical mottos in Western history and it's normally translated as seize the day. It's sometimes translated differently, harvest the day yeah. or enjoy the day or pluck the day right. and these different meanings really reflect the fact that carpe diem means different things to different people for some people it's about grasping a once in a lifetime opportunity right. like to change career or to rescue a crumbling relationship yeah. for other people it's about hedonism it's about sensory pleasures and touching whether it's sex or gastronomy and then for other people season the day is all about living in the here and now it's about present moment awareness yeah so all these meanings are wrapped up in it but the original term carpe diem goes back to a roman poet horace who 2000 years ago wrote a little poem and its last two lines sum up what it's all about he said even as we speak envious time flies past seize the day and leave as little as possible for tomorrow and really, what's he saying? He says, how should we live in the face of death? Like on my t-shirt you can see here. Oh, death wow, you have and freedom. <laughs> and so it's really... Is can it we... your own merchandise? Yeah, well, it's book? from the book. It's yeah. from the book. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's okay. how should we live out our autonomy? How can we become the authors of our own lives, express our freedom, but given the fact that we are not here forever? Yeah. Life is short and the clock is ticking. Everybody has its own interpretation out of that one sentence. Yeah, and people have been interpreting it for these 2,000 years. Yeah. What's really interesting, though, is that some of the interpretations are new. So the idea that seizing the day, Carpe Diem, is all about living living in the here and now, kind of mindful present moment awareness, is a totally new idea. Yeah. Ask someone a hundred years ago what Carpe Diem meant to them, they would never have said being in the now. Yeah. But today they do, and that's partly due to the rise of the mindfulness movement, for right. example, where more and more people are feeling that they are doing rather than being, rather than seizing the moment. It's almost let the moment seize us. Right. Yeah, because you're also criticizing the mindfulness movement a little bit, right? That we're so much in the moment that we're very much present with ourselves and not with the world? Yeah, partly. Yeah. I think that, though, you know, maybe like you, I don't know, but I've done lots of mindfulness courses mm. of different kinds, but I found that the modern kind of secular versions of mindfulness, in contrast to like the Buddhist style, they tend to be quite me, me, me yeah. oriented. Yeah. And I interviewed this famous French Buddhist monk for my book, a guy called Mathieu Ricard, who's known as the happiest man in the world. Right. And he said to me, he said, well, the problem with those modern mindfulness courses is that you could have a mindful sniper or a mindful psychopath. You know, to be a sniper, you know, shooting your gun, you've got to be completely in the present, absolutely calm and focused, non-judgmental, just kill people and no judgment. Right. He was kind of joking in a way. Yeah. But he also knows that, of course, those mindfulness courses are sometimes used in military training in the United States or Wall Street bankers using mindfulness to stay calm during high state steel making. Right. And from the Buddhist perspective is really to say, well, let's do mindfulness, but let's do mindfulness with morals. Let's integrate right. ideas of compassion yeah. or empathy or altruism or caring into yeah. it rather than turning it into something that is sort of marketed for the age of individualism. Right, thinking about others as well. I just want to zoom in on one of the interpretations now because you uh, also talk about spontaneity. I totally related with this part because I also lived in South Africa seven years ago and met like a completely different lifestyle there. You lived in Madrid, right? In Brazil. What did you learn mostly from these experiences? I learned that I'm an incredibly unspontaneous person. <laughs> Uh, but not just me, in a way, Western culture is, yeah. not all Western culture, but that we've been losing our spontaneity for 500 years. Yeah. In medieval carnival times, of course, in the Middle Ages was partly a time of death and disease and war. People lived with a kind of spontaneity that we can't imagine today. During carnival, people would dance and sing and drink and play games and theatre on the streets and stuff. And we've lost that for lots of reasons. Right. Partly the Protestant Reformation crushed the idea of spontaneity. So the church started banning carnivals. Then came the Industrial Revolution, which made us obsessed with time and the factory clock clocking in and clocking out. Right. We became interested in efficiency. Now it's the 
information overload of digital culture where we're constantly filling up our electronic calendars weeks in advance and there's no time left for spontaneity. I think we need to challenge this culture which is destroying our capacity to spontaneously seize the day. And I like to do it in a very subversive way. How do you do it? I like to do it, one of the ways I like to do it anyway, is to challenge this planning culture by actually planning my spontaneity. So by putting into my diary, for example, you know, I like to do my spontaneity between about three and six on a Sunday afternoon. Right. Which sounds insane, right? Yeah. How can you plan spontaneity? What I do is I don't plan what I'm going to do. But yeah. when three o'clock comes along, I know I have three hours for nothingness. for wildness and nothingness. Right. So I might say to my kids, right, let's go and have a picnic up a tree yeah. or something like that. And in a way, we need almost artificial methods of bringing more spontaneity in our right. lives because there's so much domination by sort of digital planning culture. It's time. quite ironic to block the time yeah. to be spontaneous. Yeah, of course there's other ways of being spontaneous too, but I think that's one very practical thing we can yeah. all do in our lives and hopefully you won't have to keep putting it in your diary all the time. <laughs> It'll become a habit in the end. Yeah, yeah. And you have a very small calendar? Yeah, I have a tiny little diary or calendar, diary, yeah. which is only about this big. It? Um, do I have it? Not on me. I tell you, I've got something else which is tiny. I think. Let's see. Oh, look, I'll show you this. Well, look, my tiny diary is about as big as this. It's exactly this size. Yeah, right. And in it, each day is about half a little finger. Um, it's big. It's tiny. So I can only fit in a couple of meetings a day. Yeah. And it keeps life free. But in fact, you might be interested in this. This is a little book of poetry from the 19th oh, century. Yeah, it's called the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. And this poem is really famous in England in the 1850s, 1860s and onwards. And this poem is all about hedonism. It's all about connecting with the pleasures of life. And I think that's quite radical today in a funny way because if you pick up a modern self-help book or a happiness book, it'll never say deal with your problems by downing a few tequila slammers or <laughs> smoking a joint under the stars. Yeah. Yet human beings have been dealing with their dilemmas and difficulties through those hedonistic sensory sort of changing state of consciousness methods for centuries. Right. When the Spanish conquistadors arrived in the Americas, they discovered the Aztecs tripping on magic mushrooms. Yeah. And this poem, in a way, was all about this kind of um, idea. So there's this bit here, look, ah, make the most of what we may yet spend before we too into the dust descend, dust into dust and under dust to lie. Song wine, song song, song singer, and song end. There's this idea that life was short mm. and we're only here for a moment. So, what are we, we going to, to do? We have to live it yeah. and be in the moments of our lives, recognize that death will come, and embrace hedonism actually as yeah. a good thing. You know, not it's not all about binge drinking and heroin <laughs> overdoses and stuff like that. Yeah, but so. what is the good balance though? Because that's every time when I'm reading it as well, it's like you're so right, and we could. We should act a little bit wilder. We're very modest nowadays. We're very crude as well, I think. And apparently it's not in our nature. That's also what you state, right? When you look back at our days or how human beings used to be. But at the same time, when we want to challenge it, it goes too far because it's not in our culture anymore. Yeah, I think there's a problem there. I mean, one of the ways I think about this is that in, in if you go to Indonesia, to the island of Bali, they have a very interesting concept of time. They have these two different kinds of days. There are what are known as full days and empty days. Mm. And the empty days are the days where you're just doing the washing and cleaning the house, or you're going to work, a normal everyday thing. And then the full days are days when there's a lot of ritual and celebration and maybe you're going to the temple and there are, you know, cockfighting and all this kind of stuff going on. And I kind of think that with respect to hedonism and even how we live our lives generally, I like the idea of having, you know, a certain number of empty days and then having occasional full days where I might really live life in an extreme way, do slightly crazy stuff, hedonistic, spontaneous, all of these things. Not doing them all the time, that would be exhausting and bad for the bank balance and my relationships <laughs> and all sorts of other things. Yeah. But it's about these like pulses, a bit like in the medieval period where they didn't have carnival every day, they were being peasants or workers, but they had these pulses or moments right. of exuberance. Because we're many-sided creatures, And there's a lot of, there's almost a cult of moderation in modern society that we ought to, you know, every book's about, you know, sort of dieting and controlling things, yes. controlling time, controlling, controlling your, your body, mind. controlling your mind. Yeah. And let us let go yeah. a little bit more, but do it in a way that is also about responsibility, thinking about how our actions affect other people. Right. You know, if everyone was seizing the day doing whatever they wanted all of the time, that could damage family, it could damage 
the planet, future generations. So we need to think of what are the boundaries on seizing the day as well. Okay, so if you give one advice to my viewers who sort of get, get a shot of carpe diem now and then, what would you say? I would say treat yourself to a daily death pause. And what I mean by that is to spend five minutes every day thinking, thinking about death, your mortality. Right. And one way to do it is there's lots of these philosophical mottos that can help you think about it. One of them is, that goes back to the ancient Romans, live every day as if it were your last. Mm. But there are lots of other ones. And if you look on my back here, uh, on the back of my t-shirt, mm. I don't know if you can see there, there's one like, you know, live as if ah, you're living yeah, every yeah, day yeah. for the second time. Live this day as if it were your last, live yeah. as if you had six months left. I like that one as well. Imagine yourself at a dinner party in the afterlife you're dead and there is a room mm -hmm. and in that room who are the guests the guests are all the other yous who you could have been if you'd made different choices so there's the you who decided to be a doctor and studied really hard to do it there's the you who got married and had four children there's the you who got depressed and became an alcoholic all right. these different yous and the question is well which of these yous do you want to talk to which of them might you want to avoid? Which of them might you envy? Mm. Are any of these the yous that you would like to be or would maybe like to become? Right. It's a way of, in a way of thinking about death, different possible lives. Right. And I think do that for a few minutes today and you might well have a taste of carpe diem on your lips. You become the true self in that way. Yeah, I think it's part of a search for authenticity. Yeah, right. In a way. And yeah. the way to do it is by confronting the finite nature of who you are. Right. You're not here forever. So that might hopefully stop you lying in bed all day or watching reruns of TV game shows. Right. <laughs> exactly what so many of us do. Thank you so much. Sorry that that vacuum cleaner came yeah. at the end. <laughs> Seize the day. Yeah. It happens. <laughs> All right, guys, that was it. My first interview ever. Let me know what you think and thought about this. This book in general is very inspiring, so I can definitely recommend you reading it. I hope you will seize the day a little bit more from now on, and I hope to see you in the next video. Although the internet can be distracting, I hope I'm not. Bye!